webinar. Uh, we will today discuss what happens to the question of peace at, as Europe goes to war. And uh, the occasion for this is first we had Afghanistan from there, United States left because uh, probably it had served their purpose to leave. And uh, then we have Ukraine where a conflict is going on between Europe, uh, or let's say the so-called democratic Europe and uh, uh, Russia. So, um, and uh, the interesting part of this conflict that is going on is that we are constantly oh. hearing that this is an occasion when we have to sort of meditate on the question as to whether we will have another world war or not. Yesterday when Macron won his elections, uh, CNN, um, you know, a uh, sort of uh, uh, person, Christian Amanpour, interviewed a, a famous philosopher, I'm not going to name names, but he said, this is not merely Marcel, I mean, this is not merely Macron's victory, but Macron here in France has defeated, defeated Putin. Someone else said, this is a victory for the democratic world. Now, the interesting thing is Europe always assumes it's the world and uh, the third world, Global South, whichever way you want to put it, Africa and Asia, it is always assumed that they're part of Europe because after all, they're all part of the colonial other of Europe. So in construction of Europe, this particular world is very, very important. So Europe and the United States is constantly invoking democracy and asking this part of the world to take sides. Not so much by Russia, but then if this part doesn't take sides, it probably serves their interest better. Now, we know that over multiple questions on sanctions, on sending this, that, and the other to the war, large groups of the erstwhile non-aligned countries have been silent. So that's why Calcutta Research Group want to ponder over the question of peace. What happens to peace? What happens to the world's workers in this conflict that is going on in Europe right now? Is this conflict really about two world views? Is it about democracy or lack of it thereof? Is Ukraine the representative of all the democratic countries. So, you know, what is it that we need to do? Does keeping silence serve the purpose of the workers, migrants, and thousands of people who are sort of, uh, you know, decoupled as Sandro uses the word from positions of power? So we have three ace thinkers who have come in today to discuss this pertinent question as to what happens to food security? What happens to security of energy? What happens to nation's security? And most importantly, is it necessary to have hierarchical refugee communities for a democracy? Because that's exactly what, see, what we are seeing. Some people call it the occasion for rearmament of the world. Some people call it, you know, two different worlds clashing, but what happens to common people like you and me in this sort of a conflict? Are we forced to say sides or can we remain non-aligned? Um, our first speaker today is Professor Sandro Mizadra, and he is a person, now the interesting thing is the three different speakers are from different parts of the world. Marcello Musto, who will be our last speaker, she just is a professor in York University, Canada. Professor Rona Vishwamadhar is the Distinguished Professor of Migration and Post-Migration Studies in Calcutta Research Group. He's in Asia. And Sandro is actually from the belly of the beast. He is a professor in, of political theory in the University of Bologna. He is also attached to the Institute of Culture and Society of Western Sydney University. We have been so familiar with Sandro's work, and he's one of the leading thinkers on globalization and migration 
and the new political processes on contemporary capitalism and in political theory and criticism. And there is a huge activist side to Sandro. He is the creator of the web Euronomad. He's also with the post barbarous debates. And uh, you know, his publications are renowned by now. Border as method, multiplication of labor, politics of operation, excavation, contemporary capitalism. And with Ranabi Shamadbar and Ethan Balibar, he edited the volume Borders of, of Justice. He's also the convener of Horizon 2020 program plus. He's a dear friend of CRG, a dear personal friend. And what people don't know about him is, apart from all of this, he's a fantastic cook. So we are all coming over to Sandro's place. Over to you, Sandro, 20, 25 minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Paula. It is always amazing uh, to be uh, with you in Calcutta, although uh, unfortunately uh, only on screen. Mm -hmm. What happens to peace? This is a question that uh, once again, we are compelled uh, uh, to ask uh, in times uh, of war. My uh, presentation today uh, will uh, ask uh, a couple of questions uh, about the nature of uh, the present uh, war. I will ask uh, what is uh, at stake in uh, the Ukraine war. First of all, uh, uh, I think uh, we have uh, to be aware uh, of the fact that uh, we are confronted with uh, a war uh, of aggression. This is something uh, we cannot uh, forget, uh, I think, uh, and uh, it has uh, specific uh, implications for the way in which uh, we struggle against uh, the war. Paula was uh, rightly saying that uh, uh, the uh, Ukraine war uh, is uh, a European war, a war that is fought in uh, the middle of Europe, uh, a war in which uh, uh, the European Union and uh, its member states uh, are uh, deeply involved. But of course, uh, we can't forget that uh, uh, also uh, the United States is uh, involved. We cannot forget uh, the role played uh, by NATO, both uh, in uh, uh, the set of uh, processes that led to the war and uh, in the current uh, development of uh, the war. It is from this point of view that uh, one uh, of uh, the main question at stake uh, in the current war is uh, the meaning of the West. And I think that uh, we have uh, to uh, ask the question regarding uh, the current meaning of the West, uh, taking seriously the hypothesis that we are confronted with uh, a relative uh, decline of the world hegemony of uh, the United States. This kind of hypothesis uh, that was put forward in the early 1990s uh, by uh, thinkers of uh, the so-called uh, world system theory, like Emmanuel Wallerstein and uh, Giovanni Arrighi has to be, according to me, taken particularly seriously. Today, it uh, builds uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, blueprint of uh, the current uh, war. 
I was speaking about uh, the uh, early 1990s. <laughs> and of course, uh, it was uh, kind of uh, historical conjuncture after uh, the end of the Cold War and the fall of uh, really existing uh, socialism in which uh, there was a general agreement uh, about uh, the fact we were, that we were uh, facing uh, a new American uh, century. I think this is an important point because also uh, NATO eastward expansion took place uh, in that particular uh, framework. I cannot expand on uh, the history of the last 30 years, of course, but uh, it is quite clear that uh, the substantial defeat of the US uh, in Iraq and uh, in Afghanistan uh, produced uh, a deep uh, change in uh, the uh, general awareness of uh, the uh, way in which uh, global uh, processes were uh, developing. Maybe even more important was uh, the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 uh, that uh, as for instance, Adam, Adam Tooze has effectively demonstrated uh, was uh, a factor of uh, acceleration of China's uh, ascent. Hmm. So uh, these were uh, crucial uh, uh, thresholds uh, that uh, uh, inaugurated uh, a different perception uh, of uh, the position of the US uh, within uh, the global order and disorder, even within uh, the US. And you can easily understand uh, uh, Donald Trump's uh, electoral uh, victory as uh, uh, kind of uh, attempt uh, uh, to uh, respond to that. In the time of mega, of make uh, America great uh, again, there was uh, not uh, uh, much uh, space uh, for uh, the reference to the West. The situation changed with uh, Joe Biden's uh, uh, administration. And uh, over the last two years, uh, the West has become uh, again a crucial political concept uh, in the discourse of uh, the US uh, administration. Of course, uh, it is a West that uh, as it had uh, already happened in the wake of uh, the Second World War, uh, was not uh, geographically defined. One of uh, the main uh, uh, struggles for uh, the definition, the material definition of uh, the West uh, is fought uh, nowadays uh, in the Indo-Pacific. What I find uh, uh, striking and what I would like to discuss to you, with you uh, today is the fact that uh, even uh, in uh, the official political discourse of uh, US uh, administration, uh, the West is today presented as a part of the world. This was not the case in the 1990s. In the 1990s, there was within the establishment and in particular within the US American establishment, a kind of expectation that the West could become world involving both Russia and China. This is not the case anymore. 
today, and uh, uh, this changes the meaning uh, of uh, the West. This changes the meaning of the West, in particular, uh, as far as Europe uh, is uh, concerned. I think that uh, one of the main uh, stakes of uh, the current war uh, in Europe uh, is precisely the relation that Europe uh, takes uh, with respect to the West. And this has also very concrete uh, kind uh, of uh, consequences. In particular, uh, regarding the relation between uh, the European Union and uh, NATO. Today, the European Union is uh, uh, in a way led and even <coughs> overwhelmed by NATO. If you know a bit uh, the uh, mm, history of uh, the European Union over uh, the last uh, 20 years, uh, you will know that uh, there were uh, uh, kind of dramatic uh, uh, geographical fault lines in the material constitution of uh, the European Union. One of them was uh, between uh, North and South and took uh, dramatic uh, forms uh, in uh, the Greek uh, crisis uh, that culminated uh, in the summer of uh, 2015. But then there was uh, another fault line, another important geographical fault line, which means uh, the fault line between the West and the East. Well, uh, to put it uh, uh, very quickly, uh, there was a dramatic transformation in the last two months. Hmm. Exaggerating a bit, I can say that uh, today, Poland matters more than Germany in the European Union. And Poland is uh, a deeply conservative, uh, nationalist uh, uh, country nowadays, uh, looking at the government, uh, of course, uh, that was uh, criticized by the uh, European Commission for uh, uh, the misrespect of the principle of uh, the rule of law in the last uh, months and years. This kind of criticism disappeared in the wake of the outbreak of uh, the war in Ukraine because uh, Poland uh, is the frontline country of uh, the uh, European Union uh, uh, in this uh, conjuncture. It is the frontline country of the European Union and of NATO. And let me say that for Poland, as well as uh, for other uh, Eastern European countries, uh, Membership of NATO is more important than, man, than man, membership of the European uh, Union. So uh, this is uh, a very uh, uh, weird situation in which uh, the future of Europe is at stake. My own uh, position is that uh, working for peace today in Europe implies working for a kind of uh, decoupling, I use again this word, this word of uh, the European Union from uh, NATO. I can say more in the discussion, uh, of course, but this is uh, a very important uh, uh, point. <laughs> What we need is a kind of different relationship also between Europe uh, and uh, the United States uh, of uh, America. <laughs> Couple of uh, words on a point uh, that uh, I find uh, particularly 
important, uh, which means uh, globalization. As Paula was uh, reminding, uh, I have been uh, working for many years now, in particular with Brett Nielsen on uh, globalization. And we have had uh, a lot of discussions with Paula, with Rana Beer and other friends uh, at uh, CRG. In a way, uh, I have been criticizing uh, the rhetoric of uh, globalization and I have tried to shed light on the materiality of global processes that constitute, in a way, uh, the, the fabric of uh, capitalism today. Well, as uh, you know, uh, already uh, in the first two years of the pandemic, uh, there were many voices uh, advocating uh, the end of uh, globalization. And uh, uh, the Ukraine war has added more voices to uh, that. I think this is a point we have to critically discuss. I don't have the time now to expand on that, but maybe later uh, we'll have a chance uh, to uh, uh, discuss. What I find uh, uh, striking is the fact that uh, both uh, in Russia and in uh, the US, uh, there is uh, a growing uh, consensus on the fact that globalization is over and the global culture wars have begun. This is the title of an article that uh, uh, came out uh, last uh, uh, week in the New York Times, uh, an article by David uh, Brooks, a respected uh, liberal uh, commentator. In Russia, you can find similar uh, tones. And this is a second point I would like to uh, uh, stress for uh, our discussion uh, today. Are we uh, confronted with a global situation that looks very much like the one envisaged or uh, proposed by Samuel Huntington in his uh, famous 1996 book, Clash of Civilizations? I don't think that was a kind of analytic book. It was a political program and we have to struggle against uh, the instantiations of a clash of civilizations that abound nowadays in and around what is happening in Ukraine. To struggle for peace today is to struggle against this uh, civilizational discords uh, of uh, clashes uh, and uh, wars uh, among uh, cultures. Mm. To conclude, mm, I think that uh, today, mm, today more uh, than ever in the last years, uh, we need to work uh, toward uh, a new internationalism. Mm -hmm. A new internationalism is urgently needed, but we have to construct it because there are groups everywhere in the world that define themselves as internationalists, and this is good, but it is not enough. Mm -hmm. We need a new discourse or new discourses of internationalism. And in particular, we need to uh, experiment with the political uh, internationalist organizations beyond the scale of uh, the uh, nation states that was uh, the constitutive scale for the historical experiences of socialist and communist uh, uh, internationalism. We know 
there was a conference in Zimmerwald more than 100 years ago during uh, the uh, Great War. And that was uh, uh, a great moment in the history of uh, internationalism. Many of us uh, have uh, uh, foreshadowed a new Zimmerwald. And I think this is uh, the right direction, but we have to be aware of the difficulties of such a task. We don't have the organizations that uh, were able to organize uh, the Zimmerwald uh, conference. In a way, we need uh, to uh, uh, invent such new international organizations in the same process in which uh, we uh, uh, work toward a new uh, Zimmerwald. So to conclude, uh, uh, this is uh, for me uh, a third uh, way to uh, tackle the question uh, about uh, peace today. I was speaking at the beginning uh, of the spaces of uh, uh, peace, particularly uh, referring to uh, Europe. I was uh, speaking of the need to struggle against uh, uh, cultural uh, wars. And now I say uh, a new internationalism. There is no real peace without uh, a new internationalism. But a new internationalism must have uh, an immediate uh, uh, task, <laughs> must uh, uh, be able to uh, open up spaces in which we construct a mobilization capable to stop the present war. If we don't stop the present war, I think uh, we will live through difficult times in the next months and uh, years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandro. So after redefining the West, Sandra talked about, uh, Professor Bezandra talked about the cultural wars and uh, the struggle between the US and Russia. And then he made an urgent call for a new international, you know, uh, on the lines of Zimmerman for uh, the peace, the peace question. Most importantly, I think it was a clarion call for this particular war to end because without this war, ending, this might go into or spill off into places where it's urgently not wanted. After all, you know, we know that Marx talked about war as always a civil war for workers. Now I will request Professor Ronavi Shamadar, who is the Distinguished Professor of Migration and Post-Migration Studies in the Calcutta Research Group to say his um, ideas on this peace question. Professor Shamadar is well known to most of our viewers today. However, I will say a few words about him. He is considered as one of the legal thinkers in the, from the School of Critical Studies. And apart from migration and forced migration, he works on governance, on post-colonial state, on questions of restructuring and you know, technologies for the control of labor, the labor question, and also the control of migrants. Just like Sandra Mizadra, Professor Ronabi Shamadar also has a tremendously vibrant activist side to his, and um, he has millions of publications. I'm not going to go through all of them now, but his recent work, The Post-Colonial Age of Migration, and his book on pandemic and life are really pathbreakers. And I'm going to mention one book, particularly because I am involved in that one too. And that is, uh, you know, his book on migrant workers and COVID-19 that came out uh, from uh, uh, Social Science Press and uh, it was also, it is being published by Rootlet. So we, we request you to buy that book, India's Migrant Worker and the Pandemic. So over to you, Professor Shamadar, for your views. 25 minutes max. 
Thank you. Uh, I am really happy and excited uh, to be a part of this discussion, uh, partly because uh, it also brings back CRGs at time, uh, I mean, once upon a time, a pioneering role in advancing peace politics and peace studies in South Asia. Uh, old uh, uh, members of CRG would remember, and even now, I think somewhere on the CRG website, it is written how CRG was born. So it was, uh, it acted as the secretarial group for the Pakistan India People's Forum for Peace and Democracy. For the first five years, it conducted peace dialogues between different uh, social groups on the conflict questions in the, in the uh, northeast of the country. And it worked for another 10 years, maybe on displacements due to war and conflict, not only civil war in India, meaning war between the government of the state and some sections of population, but also war between India and Pakistan, warlike condition, and what happens to the common people. So that CRG has decided to engage once again on the peace question is, is heartening, and I think it is also redeeming uh, in many ways. So I therefore speak of the peace question primarily as a peace activist. I agree with most of what my dear friend Sandro has mentioned, uh, two, three things. I, I am very happy that he has mentioned the international dimension, the question of what is Europe. And these were the things that I thought I would explain at length, but since Sandro has uh, uh, already referred to that, I'll just mention them when the time comes. Now, as a peace researcher or as a peace activist, we must begin with the fact that the just war theory doesn't apply here. For a group or for a political force that wants to work on peace, in this context, there is no ground to accept the just war theory uh, you know, formulations. If you do so, or if we do so, then the ground and the scope to frame peace politics will become very narrow to the point of being impossible. I will explain that later, but I think this is important. This is not to say that wars cannot be just, but certainly we have to understand that the neoliberal time has affected a great change in the patterns of global conflicts. In Rwanda, there was no just war by any side. I can mention several wars and not only internal conflicts, but let's say the internecine war that led to the dissolution of Yugoslavia there was no just war. So first thing, and I know this is a controversial point, but first thing first, that we have to discard the just war theory. And shockingly many, you know, uh, uh, how would I put it, left liberals and confirmed le leftist thinkers have picked up the just war theory in order to jump into the Ukrainian conflict, they sacrificed the banner of peace. They forgot their duties and uh, their basic plank was just war. One of the reasons I will mention very few, one of the reasons is that if you look at humanitarianism, this is a glass that is showing cracks from side to side. Uh, Paula mentioned in the beginning the humanitarian question, how it is being weaponized. Indeed, humanitarianism by itself has been weaponized. And as part of that, the refugee question has been weaponized. Uh, the sanctions are the weaponization of global economy. And on top of that, again, something I, 
hope that there is discussion and I know that this is a very controversial thing. But with uh, friends uh, in the discussion, uh, this is the time to air our views and discuss. Also, there is a blatant display of something that was long in the tradition of war, which is the tradition of creating human shields. One of the things that I want to uh, relate on this is that on one hand, there is a general principle of peace and the left has to work for peace. But at the same time, this general principle is not enough unless we come to grips with the particular situation, analysis of the particular context, and devise what can be the peace strategy, how to articulate the question of peace. Now, if you think of humanitarianism, and if we want to call to public notice the way humanitarianism has been weaponized in this war, I can give you the example of human shield. Now, this phrase human shield actually emerged only following the Second World War, even though the practice of human shielding has been common for a very long time. I mean, take, for example, 17th, 7th century, Chinese and quote unquote barbarian tribes on the Turco Mongol frontier as human buffers. While well, Mongols deployed prisoners as shields during their conquests. In the 11th century, crusaders were advised to set their Muslim captives out naked in chains to take the force of enemy missiles. And throughout the Middle Ages, hostages were used as human shields in different battles and conflicts. There are, of course, willing human shields also. We know the very famous example and someone whose name should be written in golden letters in all peace activist chambers, you know, Rachel Tori, you remember, who wanted to shield the Palestinian victims as their houses were being bulldozed by the occupation regime and died. But mostly human shields are involuntary. People who are forced to serve as buffer and a careful record of historical, you know, a careful reading of historical records would reveal that their use has not been uncommon. But we forgot that most of the time, who can become a refugee and who cannot become a refugee? Who is allowed to leave the country? Who will be disallowed from leaving the country? These are all political decisions and these decisions are essentially coercive in nature. The history of human shielding touches in fact, therefore several nerves. And if you see the weaponization of the whole refugee regime, uh, again, there is no time to go into that. You will notice that this history tells us who deserves to be treated humanly at a given historical moment and who does not. And therefore, as we know, this history illustrates how racial, class, religious, sexual, gender orders, they all help uh, and shape our understanding of the, of the human and therefore the ethics of violence and legal frameworks. This is very important because the peace activists would today would have to confront, quote and unquote, the humanitarian. I am not saying that they will drop the flag of humanitarianism, but I think the time has come to engage with the certain crucial aspects of the present war uh, squarely with new formulations, with taking the neoliberal context into account. That will show us that while there are continuities to the liberal way of waging war, but uh, in the neoliberal time, there are discontinuities also, which also means that uh, Sandro was mentioning the clash of civilization. Now, democracy has become, for good or bad, a culture. Word. It is part of a civilization. While authoritarianism is again a culture word, it forms a part of culture word, and it is part of the other, the enemy of liberal civilization. So the liberal international order is a very accepted phrase, yet as some scholars are pointing out that there is a great delusion. Now, whether there is a, it is a delusion, <coughs> whether liberal dreams are confronting the international realities, I wouldn't put it like that. But all I can say is that, that 
while some of the peace activists would say that we don't have to think of the context, but no peace question can be articulated, no peace politics can be framed without taking the context into account. And if you see after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, it was widely believed and anticipated that the West, which would mean, and Sandro is right, that without the United States, you, can, you cannot think of West or Europe, but that would fall into discussion, the whole question of NATO that has framed Europe. I do not think that at any point of time, except in certain economic sphere, uh, the, the, the Europe was ever, uh, you know, uh, apart from what can be called the Atlantic uh, community. So they thought that after this dissolution of uh, the USSR, uh, they would be able to consign, let us say, the illiberal orders across the globe to, uh, someone mentioned the question of a clash of civilization. So let us say to the dustbin of history, there will be a push for open economies. There will be a push for all embracing institutions. And under that cover, but it is not new, in as much as uh, you know, colonialism or liberal ideas followed the flag of trade in the colonial time, it's the same thing that uh, that uh, under the garb of uh, democracy and uh, and uh, and economic and uh, you know uh, support for liberalism, you have once again a new flag of war, uh, you know, being uh, hosted and flagged. So the transmutation from a bipolar alignment to 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 the idea that uh, that uh, this bipolar alignment is over and now democracy can safeguard human rights, advocate global peace, ratify democratic establishments. This it has to be subjected to fundamental critique, and the indiscriminate way we have adopted this word democracy, uh, uh, turning it from a political thing to a cultural thing, has you know has destroyed. Uh, or, or has destroyed to a great extent the chances of peace politics. So therefore, peace politics has to understand what are the, the adversity. If you think of the weaponization of economy, and Sandra was referring to Adam Tooze, so, you know, uh, uh, besides Tooze, others are also, uh, you know, uh, explaining this, but clearly trade and finance, they are intimately associated and the disruption in one is mirrored in the shock to the other. Uh, we are living through that reality. Now, whether these shocks are truly systemic or not, we don't know. But on the other hand, it is true that the overall financial system will no doubt be affected in an unforeseen way. And global trade will become multipolar. I mean, uh, the transition in any case would have come if you ask me, but it would have been less anarchic, but then war always invites great changes. We always try to disband war from our thinking. But the unfortunate thing is that all peace activists must contend with war, must think of war when they frame their politics, peace politics. You cannot think of peace without thinking of war and the context of war and what war will be bringing about. It was true of the post Second World War situation. It was only with the Second World War that you could have the Geneva Conventions, that you could have a uh, basis of a new legal order, you could have the Bretton Woods system, you could have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then one can go on and on, and you could not have uh, the great decolonization uh, uh, revolutions in Africa, Asia, and certainly parts of Latin America. So the concrete question of war has to be understood and how war uh, finance has become a, a, a part of war. I mean, we can think of harsh sanctions that the US imposed on Venezuela, Iran, and North Korea. Yes, they have weakened these economies, but can we say that because of sanctions, they have changed politics or policies of these countries in the way the US government or Europe have sought? No. Sanctions, again, they are easy to avoid, evade, at least in part. And more evasions emerging over time will lead to more energy. We can think of, you know, uh, uh, rising number of transactions with Russia in rubles, Indians in rupees, the Chinese in renmin riba, uh, sorry, renminbi, or uh, other non-dollar currencies. And clearly, we have here 
uh, uh, in spite of all the sanctions and, and all the things, we think uh, that, and, I, and this is where I shall say that possibly uh, 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 this is the, 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 the euro dollar axis and the euro dollar link is possibly the last frontier in terms of Western dominance. Uh, it is the last frontier that will probably be vanquished. And what the result will be, we do not know, because this is unlike Second World War. As I'm saying that uh, in case of Second World War or pre-Second World War time, you had a floating uh, you know, basket, but you have also pound, even though the pound didn't dominate in the way today, dollar dominance. Uh, but uh, this is something. All these leads me to my last but one point that this war, because it's been conducted in the neoliberal time, you may say that there is one of the, uh, one of the uh, uh, obstacles that peace activists would have to confront is the whole question of what is normally called the fog of war. Peace activists for years, uh, uh, whether from Mali to Afghanistan, or from uh, uh, erstwhile Yugoslavia to Libya, Iraq, Afghan uh, Palestine, peace activists, they have risked their lives for that. So it's not a question of justifying war. But on the other hand, uh, we need to confront the fog of war because we must understand what led us to this situation. So we have to examine the roots of the Ukrainian conflict. We cannot avoid this task. It may start with those who thought that during the Maidan uprising in, in 2013 and then 14 and all that, that uh, uh, this was a great road to democratization. We have to find out how many left really called out the sham. Uh, we may say that Ukraine was uh, fighting separatists or independentists in the Donbas region. There will be other versions, but I do not think that uh, the whole question of referendum uh, the way media has covered it, uh, whether it was a referendum for independence, but all they have asked for autonomy, all these things we have to, you know, uh, ask ourselves very clearly. And we have to, as I say, that we have to fight the fog of war. And we cannot take, uh, you know, shelter behind the fact that oh, all parties are now conducting uh, the media war. But this is a lame excuse. This is, I think, a lazy way of doing uh, peace research or peace activism. I think what constitutes the fog of war, how it is contributing to war, is very important. And avoiding it, evading it, I do not think that we can, uh, we can, you know, uh, come squarely to the whole task of how do we articulate peace. What will be the the main principles? The final question. Is there any middle ground? And uh, you, uh, and that is where uh, uh, I think I again appreciate Sandro's point that why it is Sandro was mentioning Poland, Ukraine, and I am reminded of uh, Balibar, uh, my elderly, you know, in many ways I have learned from him. And I reread his piece, uh, you know, very famous lecture, The Borders of Europe. And I remember, uh, I think Paula was present. I, I have a, my memory may be weak. Probably Sandro was present, but I do not know. But in a seminar in Paris, I asked him uh, that you this great article, great lecture. In Greece, you speak of the borders of Europe on the East. What about the West? Where does the European border? Uh, I still remember uh, that he, he thought that I was, you know, unnecessarily provoking a, you know, a question, but I thought at that time, this was important. I thought that he was looking at the border question as a Europeanist. But if you really have to look at the border, you have to look at it, quote and unquote, from the outside to see where the border is. If you read of uh, these famous histories of uh, Atlantic trade and the export of uh, slaves or human labor in the 17th century, I have been mentioning that Shakespeare was one of the shareholders of the first company, chartered company, that uh, transported uh, uh, human beings for labor in, uh, supposedly to New England, but it crashed and landed in uh, Jamaica. So the frontier has already been, the, the Atlantic and the border was there. And today, the new borderland, 
Ukraine, Poland. These are the new borderlands. And what is interesting for those who do border politics is that this borderland, which was thought to be a very harmless concept or a concept for human rights activists, those who want to avoid the harshness of the concept of border, and they tried to take shelter behind the concept of borderlands where people come and go, there will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe illegal, but necessary traffic of commodities, ideas, intermingling at that, all very good thing. But they all forgot that borderland is first the land where the militarization will begin, and then the border will be militarized. So the whole American strategy, for that matter, the NATO strategy of actually arming Georgia today, expanding, why it is expanding on the West? Why does it want to, doesn't want to expand on the South, let us say, across the Mediterranean? There, the NATO will only conduct operations. It will conduct operations in former Yugoslavia, it conducted, it conducted operation in Afghanistan, it will conduct operation in, conducted operation in Libya, but no question of taking them in the NATO. But why it is that Poland, Ukraine, Finland, everyone has to fall in line or is tempted to fall in line, to falling in line, because this is the borderland where bypassing the classic liberal Western Europe, today neoliberalism can militarize and go on further conquest. Therefore, the borders of Europe would have to be thought of in a new way from the angle of the active peace activists and not from the angle of quote and unquote human rights and democracy. Because what is a frontline country is being determined again in, if I use Sandra's word, uh, materially, which means that materially it is constituted by clash of arms, clash of economy, clash of politics, clash of social forces, and peace politics is extremely contentious. So is there therefore, given this reality, the right to remain neutral? It is not only a question of uh, the global South remaining neutral. I don't think it's a question of only the non-Europeans remaining neutral, even though uh, beyond the metaphorical thing, there is some element of reality in that. But the right to reclaim neutrality and the right to the heritage of non-alignment that the uh, massive Afro-Asian world, uh, those who got decolonized, when they claimed, we have to understand, and I am just recalling Sekuturi, Kenyatta, these are very famous declarations in the UN in 50s, in 60s, in 70s, why they want to remain neutral. Why it is that they say that to ask for peace, to work for peace, the first thing in such kind of conflicts is to remain neutral. So I think one of the questions that we have to, and I shall stop here, that we have to think of is the historical basis of the right to be neutral. And on the other hand, on that historical basis, claim this right in today's context. That will lead us to something that CRG had practiced. Unfortunately, CRG in the last 10 years had forgotten uh, or we became oblivious or we didn't give enough importance to the peace question in, the, in our work on migrants, refugees, uh, friendships and histories of enmity, etc., is the whole question of what is the peace process and how do we conduct peace on it? How do you audit the peacemaking capacity of a society? What are the forces of peace? And I'm so happy that uh, Sandro uh, raised the question of Zimmerwald. Now, Zimmerwald is something that has been made immortal, not only in the history of the socialist, internationalist, communist thought, but you see if in the writings of not Rosa, but Lenin, who was in a minority, uh, the, the, the Bolsheviks and other left-wing socialists of that time, who made Zimmer World the remarkable conference of the political activists of that time. They have given us the blueprint of how to work for peace. If you can sum up in one minute. Yes, in one minute. And therefore, if you speak of Zimmer World and think of Lenin, I remember I had a, I was having a conversation with uh, Sandro when I was in Europe uh, a month or two months ago, that Lenin who made, in a way, Zimmer World, Zimmer World also reshaped or shaped Lenin's politics further. Lenin said that if you have to work for peace, the peace question, you have to bend the reality towards peace. The reality is given, but that reality appears to 
many people in as many ways as possible. How do we bend the reality to what we work for? How do we assess the peacemaking capacities of society? How do we facilitate forces that will be working for peace? That is, I think, what to recall Lenin's this very famous phrase that we have to bend the reality to the cause of uh, peace and to the cause of socialism. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranubhita. Ranubhita begins by uh, invoking uh, the legacy of working on peace in Calcutta Research Group and brings it to the question of peace. And he says that there are just wars, which itself is uh, a critical notion. And I, I think a lot of what he says will evoke a lot of questions and debate. He comes to his conclusion that uh, he sides with Sandro that, you know, um, in talking about how we can sort of think of a worldview and peace from a different perspective right now. And he, he asks that uh, to understand the question of peace, we have to understand the roots of war. And then he says, is there a middle ground and makes a stinging sort of criticism of that particular middle ground in the process he also criticizes CRG. So we will have to, you know, contend with what Professor Tomadna seeks. I, I myself want to jump into the debate right now, but I will hold myself back because we have another A speaker, and that is Marcello Musto. Marcello Musto is a professor of sociology at York University, and uh, he's made significant contribution for revival of Marx studies in the last one, two decades, I would say. In fact, a dear friend of mine who is extremely Marxist said that he is the presiding deity of Marx studies now. So um, we, are, we are looking forward to listening from him. His books that I have read is Another Marx, Early Manuscripts to the International in 2018, and then Last Years of Karl Marx, an intellectual biography. And, uh, you know, one has to mention some of his edited works, which are extremely influential for our thinking on Marxism today, Karl Marx Grundriss. I think that's an excellent volume. And then Workers Unite. I'm missing a lot of his uh, very important contribution because I can go on and on. He is the editor for Palgrave, the, uh, you know, the collection on Marx, Engels and Marxism. And he's also the series editor for a number of other publication houses. We're all excited that we already had two very excellent speakers, Sandro Mezadra and Ronavi Shomadar. Now let us listen to Marcello Mosto. So Marcello, you have 25 minutes. Good evening to everybody. And Paula, many, many thanks for this <clears throat> very generous, perhaps too generous introduction. It's a pleasure for me to discuss with um, Ranabir with Sandro to return to you. I was already in Kolkata a few years ago, even though online. And um, I want to clarify the, the uh, I will say the uh, scope, the boundaries of my uh, presentation today. I was asked by Ranabir Samadar to give a presentation, perhaps also in order to avoid repetitions um, around the topic war and the left in the last 150 years. So what is the history? What is the relationship that the left had, the conflictual relations sometimes that the left had with regard to the big question of war? And uh, I hope that you will see that during my presentation, um, during which I will have two risks, one to be superficial, the other one perhaps to read too many quotations, but I will try to do this in order to be as precise as possible. You will see during this short presentation that some of the topic that Sandro Mezzadra and Rana Bishamadar mentioned, for example, the question of a war of aggression or the question of a just war uh, mentioned by, by, by Rana Bir, war of defense, for example, these are just things that happen already in the past to labor movement. And what we want to do is learn from the experience of the past. 
So first of all, what is the main characteristic of the labor movement in uh, with respect to understanding wars? I will say that it's the nexus between the development of capitalism and the spread of wars. Because from the very beginning, from the first international, war was no longer explained like the science of politics uh, with ideological, um, political, or sometimes even psychological motivations and category, but particularly with relation to economic categories. So for example, we know that wars are inevitable under the capitalist production. And if we go back, as I said, to the debate of the first international already in 1868, there is this idea that wars cannot be explained with the ambitions of monarchs or other individuals, but they must be understood in relation to the dominant social economic model. Close to this, there is another important point for us. That is the idea that the labor movement is fighting for the final abolition of all wars. And that very important for me, all wars should be considered like civil wars. There is no difference if a war is done between workers of different countries or of different city within the same country. Wars must be abolished. Karl Marx never produced, um, I would say, um, a non-contradictory or a non-fragmentary analysis of war. We know that his constant view was the opposition to Tsarist Russia at the time. It was on the contrary Engels who wrote about war um, a lot, particularly at the end of his life. And perhaps very few people know that Engels wrote a series of articles in 1843, and they were published together under the title, Can Europe Disarm? And in these articles, level Engels is talking about the unprecedented level of arm production um, and the risk that this will mean, because for Engels, this is the real um, uh, danger of creating a war of destruction like the world has never seen. This is 1893, imagine now. What happens uh, from the 1870s, uh, but particularly at the end of the 19th century, is the confrontation, is the fact that I would say labor movement is no, lo no longer confronting with war just as a theoretical debate in peacetime, but now is dealing with this as the foremost political issue of the age, of the time. This is already starting in 1870, just before the Paris Commune, at the time of the Franco-Prussian conflict, when, for example, the uh, members of parliament, the few members of parliament of the German social, Dem social democracy, Bebel, Lipnet, they voted against they reject the bills for additional funding to continue the war. They went to jail, they were sent to jail, but they show an alternative way to act in front of wars. And this was also important at the beginning, at the foundation of the Second International in 1889, when at the founding Congress of this organization, it was written in the document, in the final document that uh, peace was an indispensable precondition of any emancipation of the workers. So for a growing part of the labor movement, I would say war is no longer seen as it was before, perhaps starting from the French Revolution, perhaps starting from 1792 revolutionary war. There is all this idea uh, that Girondins considered these wars as a crusade for liberty, like the most glorious form of the working class to fight against oppressor and to export the revolution outside France. Note that Robespierre is against this and Robespierre wrote, liberty is not brought at the point of bayonets. But I will say that this ideology is now challenged, right? And war is no longer seen as opening up revolutionary opportunity and hastening the breakdown of the system. Not entirely, at least. In the very important Stuttgart Congress of 1907, there was um, a resolution called on militarism and international conflict. And mostly there were three points that were accepted by all the delegates of the conference. A vote against budget that increased military spending, 
The fact that there is an antipathy, I will say, towards standing army and a preference for a system of people's militia. And then, of course, this idea that is coming from the bourgeois side, the support for the plan to create courts of arbitration to settle international conflicts peacefully, right? Later, there will be more debates. I don't have time to talk about this. But I just want to say that everybody is voting in favor of this, including in favor of amendments that were prepared by Luxembourg and Lenin, because this was not going to uh, force political parties in their countries, for example, the SPD in Germany, to make any change to their political lines. This document, this resolution was the last documents who was voted unanimously at the second international. And I would say that after this time, there is always less and less involvement from the second international um, in order to create a policy of action in favor of peace, right? So, and we know how this story ended. The second international proved to be completely impotent in the face of war and, uh, you know, failed the main objective that was, you know, the preservation of peace. In this period, and I'm of, of course talking about the Great War, World War I, there is a growing, um, um, in the minority, of course, but there is a, a new movement against war. I'm talking about Zimmerwald Congress, Kintal Congress, 1915-16, and then, of course, the two major thinkers, Rosa Luxemburg and uh, Vladimir Lenin. Luxembourg was particularly brilliant. We know her because she said that war on war, this slogan should become the cornerstone of the working class politics. And uh, she also argued that the main goals of the proletariat should be fighting imperialism and preventing wars in peace as in war times, also in peacetime. And Engels wrote um, an interesting piece, Socialism and War, 1915, where Engels is going against Lenin, sorry, is going against the historical falsification that the bourgeoisie tried to demonstrate at the time um, about what were called progressive national liberation wars, wars of uh, um, progressive liberation. For Lenin, this is not true. And these were just wars of plunder, he wrote, wars in which belligerents were this time to oppress the most foreign peoples and to increase the inequality of capitalism. So it was just about who, which side of the belligerent were going to oppress more the foreign people. Lenin is also going against the social chauvinist. This is the category with this terminology of the time, because he said that beyond the claim to defend the feather land, there is actually this idea that great powers had the right to pillage the colonies and oppress foreign people. So defensive of just wars were for Lenin possible and doable, but not in the sense of thinkers like uh, Jean Jaurès, like you know, European powers defending from other European powers, but in the sense of going against imperial powers. And this is also the time where Lenin in this text is you know, um, creating this very famous slogan, turn imperialistic war into civil war. In any case, I also wanted to mention that war, this topic is also creating debate, dramatic debates, and also um, big splits, huge splits also in other camps, not only in the social democracy or in Marxist tradition. This is also the case of anarchism, for example. Kropotkin, the most famous anarchist when he was alive at the end of his life, I'm talking about during World War I, he was against Germany because he was afraid that if Germany would win the war, this will decrease the level of emancipation in Europe. So he wrote that the task of any person holding dear the idea of human progress is to squash the German invasion in Western Europe. You will see that in my quotation, there is the attempt to show you similarities with today, because we are not for the first time approaching this issue. Um, so we are asking the same question with Russia today that uh, perhaps Kropotkin was considering at the time in relation to, you know, uh, Germany and uh, in relation to 
the aggressive politics of German belt politique. But Enrico Malatesta, and with Malatesta, the majority of the anarchists of the time, they argued that for the general good against the common enemy of democracy, a struggle like this is um, um, something that will bring working classes to uh, um, subjugation of ruling classes. Like what uh, Malatesta is trying to say is that a German victory will certainly spell the triumph of militarism. I'm reading from this anti-war international manifesto of 1915, but also the triumph for the allies will mean Russian British domination in Europe and Asia. So there is a no to Germany, but also no to Russian British alliance. And this is similar to what we are trying to do today. None of the belligerents has any rights to claim the um, um, flag of civilization is writing manifesto, um, uh, Malatesta in this manifesto. The same debate, the same split, similar at least, happened in the feminist movement. Because at the time where women were replacing conscripted men in jobs, right, men who were sent to, to war, um, they were able to understand, at least with the help of, uh, you know, um, communist women leader like Clara Zetkin, Rosa Luxemburg, Rosa Luxemburg um, Kollontai, uh, Pankhurst, they were able to understand that in evoking the enemy at the gates, and this was the propaganda was doing at the time, war was used to roll back fundamental social reforms. And also the struggle against militarism was understood as an essential element of the struggle against patriarchy. It is very complicated for me now in the few minutes that I have to summarize the debate that happened in the 1920s, 1930s. I just want to mention that um, there is this idea that the new 1914, a new war is inevitable so in the labor movement, the talk was more and the debate was more of what to do if a new war broke out, then how to prevent from a new war to start. At least, um, you know, the real debate, not the position that were um, sometimes appearing in articles at the time. And there is also a language of war that is still very strong, although you know, Europe is destroyed after the, the Great War. Take, for example, the terminology used by Mao Zedong in 1930s, this uh, omnipotence of revolutionary war. I'm reading for Problems of War and Strategy, 1938. The sides of power by armed force, the settlement by, of the issue by war is the central task of the Igus form of revolution. Um, this ideology is uh, um, reinforcing itself um, within um, um, actually existing socialism with the great patriotic war that started in 1941 in response to the attack made by Hitler to Soviet Union and later the division of the wars into bloc. Um, this ideology is becoming uh, prominent in Soviet Union. And there is a big difference with the initial position that I mentioned at the beginning of my, of my talk. This is also true at the time of the peaceful coexistence, right? The attempt from Khrushchev to um, start a new political course uh, of Soviet Union. This is happening internationally perhaps, but within the so-called socialist camp, this is not the case. Uh, in 1956, before peaceful uh, coexistence, um, Soviet Union already invited, um, invaded uh, Hungary. And in 1968, as it is well known, there is the same with uh, Czechoslovakia. Brezhnev mentioned in a very famous speech at the Congress of the Polish United Workers' Party in 1968, I'm reading the topic, the concept of limited sovereignty. So Brezhnev said, when forces that are hostile to socialism try to turn the development of some socialist country toward capitalism, it becomes not only a problem of the country concerned, but a common problem concern of all socialist country. 
Of course, according to this anti-democratic logic, the definition of what is socialist and what is not socialist uh, fell to the arbitrary decision of the Soviet leaders. But what I'm trying to say is that the negative role of Soviet Union is increasing more and more, and there is a very a different message from the position of labor movement. I can make other examples, perhaps the most famous one is Afghanistan in 1979. And there are also the so-called socialist wars, right? The war between Cambodia and Vietnam or China and Vietnam at the time of the Sino-Soviet conflict that dissipated, in my opinion, the last or whatever leverage um, remain of this um, so-called Marxist ideology already remote from the original foundation laid by Marx and Engels that war are exclusively um, the cause of uh, capitalism, right? Here there is a so-called socialist war between socialist countries. There were no changes after 1989, as we know. The end of Cold War did not lessen the amount of interference in other country affairs, nor did it um, increase the freedom of every people to choose the political regime under which to live. And in the last five minutes, um, I will try to speak about today, but always with this historical approach that I try to, to add um, so far, because the Russian-Ukrainian war um, has again faced the left with the question of what to do, the dilemma of what to do uh, when a country's sovereignty is uh, under attack, as has been said also during the first two contribution to our debate. And I will uh, quickly overview three different positions. The first position is the position of those who fail to condemn um, a Russia invasion of Ukraine clearly, strongly. I can make the example of the government of Venezuela, for example. And in my opinion, this makes a future denunciation of possible future war, possible future act of aggression committed by United States, for example, they will appear less credible. Um, and also, I think that the left should have learned from the 20th century uh, that the alliance with uh, my enemy's enemy uh, they were often counterproductive, particularly where the left is weak and when there are very um, uh, weak um, social movements uh, against war or for emancipation. I would like to recall a quotation from Lenin from the text, The Social Revolution and the Rights the Nation to Self-Determination, because left has historically supported the principle of national self-determination. And Lenin is writing, the fact that the struggle for national rebellion against one imperialist power may, under certain circumstances, be utilized by another great power in its equally imperialist interests should have no more weight in inducing social democracy to renounce its recognition of the right of nation to self-determination. And actually, there is a, a juicy quotation that Lenin is doing the year after in the result of the discussion on self-determination, where he wrote, if the socialist revolution were to be victorious in Petrograd, Berlin, and Warsaw, the Polish socialist government, like the Russian and the German socialist government, will renounce the forcible retentions of Ukrainians with the frontiers of the Polish state. So why should we accept anything different and this to be conceded to the nationalist government led by Vladimir Putin. But at the same time, I also want to strongly criticize the other position, the position of the left who has the temptation, who has ceded to the temptation to become directly or indirectly co-belligerents, right? This left that is fueling this uh, um, new Union Sacre, this left that we saw clapping Zieliski in the parliaments of different countries where the president of Ukraine were giving uh, speeches um, asking for, you know, more um, uh, troops and, uh, you know, um, ammunitions, etc. I want to say that um, history shows that when the left is not opposing war and uh, is um, 
uh, progressive forces lose an essential part of their reason for existence and end up being very similar to the right, to the ideology of the opposite camp, the camp that they should fight. There are many examples also in the last few years, like the Italian communists supporting uh, the war in Kosovo in Afghanistan, or today a significant part of the um, Unidas Podemos in Spain, or also the Finnish left at the government today and their opening to, to NATO, many of them, at least too many of them. Um, I would like to end with uh, a couple of quotations from Marx um, from the 1850s. They contain, in my opinion, interesting and useful parallels with the present day. Um, in 1857, in a short piece that seems to be written for Putin, Marx wrote, one merely needs to replace one series of names and dates with others, and it becomes clear that the policies of Ivan III and those of Russia today are not merely similar, but identical. Ivan III is the Tsar that um, laid the ground for autocracy in Russia. And at the same time, in an article written for the New York Tribune, Marx wrote, it is a mistake to describe the war against Russia as a war between liberty and despotism. Marx is fighting the liberal Democrats who exalted the anti-Russian coalition because for Marx, Bonaparte would be then the representative of democracy and um, the whole uh, object of the war would be the maintenance of Vienna agreement those agreements which annul the liberty of independence of nations. So in my opinion, if we replace Bonaparte with United States of America, and we replace the Vienna Agreement with uh, NATO, this observation seems as if they were written for us today. So the position, the, our position, the last one, the third one is those who think to oppose both Russian and Ukrainian nationalism, as well as the expansion of NATO, the position of non-alignment. Um, those who propose a policy of non-alignment, in my opinion, this would be the most effective, or we should say would have been the most effective way of ending war as soon as possible, and also ensuring the smallest numbers of victims. There is the problem about NATO, because now it is, of course, there is a growing consensus. I make the case on Finland. There is also the case of Sweden. So we should do as much as we can to demonstrate that NATO is the largest and the most aggressive war machine in the world, dangerous and an ineffectual organization that actually fuel tensions leading to war in the war. And I will also say, and this is my final point, that the left should return to this idea indicated by, by Lenin, the idea that there are progressive wars. I believe that Lenin is saying, you know, Marxists are not pacifists or anarchists and they are not against all war. They deem it necessary historically to study each war separately. I believe that it would be a mistake, a short-sighted to simply repeat this in contemporary societies contemporary society with weapons of mass destruction continually, continually spreading. I'm done, Paula, just one final minute. So rarely wars had the democratizing effect that the theories of socialism hope for. They have often proved to be the worst way of carrying out a revolution and war disseminate an ideology of violence, of nationalist sentiment that have turned the workers' movement apart and rarely have favored practice of self-management and direct democracy, they actually increase the power of authoritarian institution. So in my opinion, for the left, we cannot say that the war is the continuation of politics by other means. In reality, war certifies the failure of politics. And if the left wishes to become hegemonic again, the left needs to write indelibly on its banners, once again, the words anti-militarism and not to war. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marcello, Professor Marcello Musto. This has been an excellent presentation. Professor Musto also brings in a stinging critique 
of the left movements. And uh, I think I am here with you when you talk about the feminist movement. We've seen how feminist cause have been always subsumed within the cause for war. You know, war is often fought in the names of women. War is often fought in the names of mothers. And we have a number of questions on that as well. I'm not going to take time away from the speakers and the people who have asked their questions, because I think already in the chat, we have a brewing debate and I'm all for it. I will pose the questions that are there to each speaker to ponder for a minute or two and then come in whenever they feel like it. Sandro Mizadra, the questions that you have, um, can all the speakers switch on their cameras, please? Speakers, please switch on your cameras. Sandro, Ranavir, and Marcello, please switch on your cameras. So the first question to Sandro Mizadra is, in your view, would you say that globalization is in a way an expansion of capitalism globally? And um, there's another question by the same uh, person. And that is, I agree with the new need for new internationalism or international order as the old order is inconsistent with the rapidly changing developments would the new international order be cognizant of the multiple powers that are emerging and the resistance of the mega powers to, uh, to accept this possibility? The next questions are to Professor Shomadar, and these questions um, are, oh, there's another question for Professor Mezadra. In, is, in this discussion for a new international, how can decolonization come in? I ask this because the world is super saturated with accepting Western civilization. Professor Shamantar has a lot of questions from John Dunn who say, who asks, how do the panelists suggest that it's possible to stop the present war without either ensuring the military de defeat of Russia or the destruction of Ukraine as a space in which its current citizens can live on terms which they can decide for themselves in a country which has not been largely destroyed as a built environment and a reliable su supply of food for a large part of the world? His second question is, I would especially like to ask Ranavir whether peace activists have any specific responsibility to try to stop the rape of mothers, and here we come to that, for hours in front of their children before they're killed in front of the children, and cities of a country are smashed to pieces. Is speaker activism completely time insensitive when it comes to the continuing destruction of a country, whether that be Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Ukraine, or Libya. His third question is, do the panelists believe that because the just war theory does not apply to most, if any wars of the last few decades, it is not that the no longer possible to recognize a naked war of aggression and no such war can leave room for a just peace if those terms are set by the aggressor at the expense of those who've been attacked. Uh, to Marcello Musto, we have the questions that uh, they say who comes with equity must come with clean hands. Countries in Africa are not openly condemning the war in Ukraine, not because NATO and USA have lost legitimacy by creating chaos in Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And the third question from John Dunn is also to you, Professor Musto. Do the panelists believe that because the just war theory does not apply to more, most, if any wars of the last few decades, it is no longer possible to recognize a naked war of aggression and no such war can leave room for a just peace if these terms are set by the aggressor. So over to the three of you, please raise your hand whenever you want to respond to the questions. And of course, anyone can pick up any question, whether it's asked to you or not, because I think the questions are related and the topics that you spoke on were related. So we are not asking you to respond to any particular question, you all three of you, our thinkers who have listened to the entire workshop. So we want you to come up and tell us your responses. Can we start with Sandro in that order? 
Sure. Hmm. Great questions and uh, great uh, presentations by uh, Ranabir and by Marcello. I think uh, we could uh, discuss for hours, uh, which means that uh, uh, we need uh, other occasions to uh, develop our uh, debate. Let me just uh, uh, mention one topic uh, that uh, did not uh, really come up in uh, the discussion. I quickly touched upon it. It's the position of China. I think uh, it's a very important question. It's a very important question also with respect uh, to South Asia with respect uh, to what is happening these days in Sri Lanka, for instance. I think that uh, the war in Ukraine is also shaping the situation in uh, Sri Lanka. And we must uh, be aware of that. We must be aware of the global implications of uh, the war, to put it very quickly. So the question regarding uh, globalization, of course, globalization has to be uh, understood as uh, a process or a set of processes uh, that uh, uh, facilitate uh, the expansion of capitalism. I think, uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, there is an important uh, point to be made here, which means uh, that capitalism is everywhere. We are not confronted uh, with a situation like the one uh, famously described uh, by Rosa Luxemburg in uh, 1913. There is no outside to capitalism nowadays. So globalization reshapes, uh, reorganize uh, capitalism. And in a way, the same is true uh, with respect to neoliberalism. Also, neoliberalism is everywhere, although uh, we have uh, understood in recent years that neoliberalism takes very different forms. We have to speak of uh, a variegated neoliberalism. Just to think of Russia. Russia is a completely neoliberalized country. Although uh, it's clear that uh, uh, neoliberalism uh, in Russia <laughs> is uh, uh, shaping uh, uh, the society, but has uh, a different kind of relationship uh, with uh, political power and uh, with capitalism writ large. <laughs> This is another point uh, we had not uh, the time uh, to discuss thoroughly. The question is for me, uh, what is capitalism in Russia? Which is the peculiarity of uh, the capitalist formation that uh, today uh, rules in, uh, in Russia? It's an important question. It's an important question, uh, particularly keep in mind what Marcello was saying before uh, about the fact that uh, the left, uh, Marxism, uh, uh, reads the dynamic of wars uh, with uh, economic categories. Uh, so Russia initiated this war. Uh, what is the relationship with the, between uh, uh, this decision, let's put it so, and the peculiar capitalist formation in Russia? Many people, particularly in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, speak of a Russian imperialism. I will not discuss this uh, uh, notion, but I think uh, it is important uh, uh, to come to grips with uh, the whole set of questions to which this notion uh, refers. 
then uh, two questions on internationalism. I'm happy uh, to take them. I was uh, kind of intrigued by the reference to multiple powers. I think uh, it's an important point, meaning that, uh, uh, to put it again uh, quickly for want of time, uh, in our uh, uh, efforts to uh, reimagine, reinvent uh, internationalism, we have to be aware of uh, the deep heterogeneity of uh, uh, the global uh, space. This is, uh, in a way, what I had in mind when I was saying that internationalism today uh, cannot take the nation as uh, uh, its uh, constitutive uh, unit, as it was uh, the case in uh, uh, historical forms of uh, internationalism. And the question of decolonization uh, is also crucial. Uh, I think uh, that uh, the legacy of uh, anti-colonial struggles must be one of the driving forces behind this attempt to reinvent uh, internationalism. I think uh, uh, we have uh, to look uh, in a detailed way at uh, movements uh, behind uh, the kind of uh, uh, widespread, uh, uh, I wouldn't say indifference, but widespread uh, um, behavior uh, not uh, to uh, join the West uh, in uh, the current uh, war. I think this is a very, very important point. I mean, also, also regarding India, I would like to have more time to discuss uh, about that. And to conclude, uh, uh, allow me uh, to uh, pick uh, up on uh, one of uh, the questions uh, asked by uh, John Dan. The question regarding uh, uh, the meaning of uh, uh, stopping the war. <laughs> The meaning of stopping the war in a situation in which, on the one hand, you have uh, the possibility of a military defeat uh, of Russia, and on the other hand, you have the possibility of the destruction of uh, Ukraine. Sure, this is the, the situation nowadays, I mean. And uh, uh, we have to do everything possible to change this situation. There must be pressure. Uh, there must be forums within which uh, a kind uh, of compromise become possible. Uh, in a war, uh, uh, a compromise is always a compromise uh, between enemies. Which is the alternative uh, to the compromise? You know, if you uh, listen to uh, the words of President uh, Zelensky, but also of President uh, Joe Biden, it seems that the only option is uh, uh, the military victory of uh, Ukraine. I'm not an expert in military affairs, but uh, from what I read, uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, such a victory can also be possible, but uh, after uh, years of war, <laughs> after years of war, <laughs> after a kind of uh, uh, occupation of uh, uh, vast parts of Ukraine, similar to the occupation of vast parts of Afghanistan, then you can have a kind of uh, prolonged uh, war of resistance, uh, and maybe Ukraine must war, uh, could win, but which would be the price? of uh, such uh, a victory. This is the reason why I think that uh, there is no alternative uh, to uh, a politics that attempts to stop the war with any means necessary. I know that uh, this is not easy. I know that, uh, uh, let's say, uh, quote and unquote, our forces uh, uh, are not particularly powerful, but uh, we have to do uh, 
everything we can do in order to change the situation in which uh, uh, the alternative that you describe in your uh, question uh, is the only alternative. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sandro. Uh, <clears throat> I will now go to Professor Shamadar. Most of the questions have been addressed to him. <clears throat> I will just have one more question because it's uh, from one of the students. And I know he's particularly caring about students asking questions. And this question is, um, can we say that Western liberal democracies try to establish new Nazi and ultra nationalist and bring them to mainstream politics in the name of countering Russian civilization? And I would also want you to reflect on some of the questions on women's rape because you know, we come from a country where women have been habitually raped by men on both sides. Women's wombs were cut off and unborn babies were taken about and the world did not shed tears. I am not saying they should not shed tears now for the cause of women. Everywhere women is used for the masculinist project of nation and nationalism. So I would also like uh, Professor Shamadar and also Professor Muslim to reflect a little bit on it. First, Professor Shamadar. Uh, Paula, can you kindly repeat the first question? I mean, of the two questions in the last round that you mentioned, the first the one- First question is student. by a student who asked whether the Western liberal democracy is, are actually in the name of contradicting Russia, contradicting Russia bringing up neo nationalists and uh, neo Nazis and ultra nationalists. Thank you. Uh, I shall begin with uh, uh, the, this last question of the student and then go to the other question, but I shall mainly. Uh, frame my responses around two things. What I think can be a possible peace politics and main slogans today, and the question of globalization, which is on border, Europe, everything is very crucial. Uh, I should preface my response with the observation again that peace politics, on one hand, can be based on uh, eternal, let us say, classical principles of socialism, of uh, communism, of working class politics, etc. But on the other hand, it has to take into consideration each concrete situation of war and make concrete analysis and advance peace politics today. And the particular nature of war would be important in turning peace politics uh, to become or in making peace politics a part of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, politics of social transformation. So that's very important and uh, that I want to, uh, you know, uh, re uh, repeat while beginning my responses. The question of globalization is important uh, because I think that the reality of globalization will be starker by which I mean the reality of its uneven nature, its multiple competing and collaborative forms, centers and consequences. And in a way, it is good because we had become accustomed to treating globalization in a very centralist model. There was only one world. But if that model is on its way out due to this war, perhaps sooner than later, or uh, sooner than we anticipated, uh, uh, there is no reason to be dismayed at that. And surely the Euro-American model of globalization is over. Nations, peoples, countries, they will claim their right to globalize in their own ways. And this is where, again, it's not the primacy of economics every time. Even the economics is also, as I said, very, very, you know, in disparate forms. So they will claim the right to globalize in their own way. Legal pluralism, currency pluralism, pluralism of trade regime, all these will soon require a global dialogue order. Perhaps this will be a kind of daily dialogue because we are so much used to this order 
maintained by the dollar euro link, much in the style of the daily plebiscite of the ancient time. The sanctions regime brings out the harsher, coercive face of globalization as we find today. But precisely these coercive uh, face will also hasten the way to multiple currency regimes. And in that sense, we cannot separate, again, the global strategy of containing Russia and China by the, by the Euro-American military uh, you know, alliance and the military coterie from the way they wanted to run globalization. So that is my first point, and I welcome the, the therefore the poser by, uh, by the particular member of the audience who raised the question of containing Russia. And as I can only repeat, a concrete analysis of a concrete situation is, is absolutely important in framing peace politics. This is a war in the neoliberal time. While there will be continuity with war and peace politics in the liberal time, but I can only repeat that we must understand the new aspects of the wars of our time. What will be the key steps for a peace politics? And again, to make clear, because uh, there have been certain ideologically loaded questions, some of the things that I didn't anticipate or didn't say, but members of the audience thought that I had wanted to say all those. There is no question for peace activists to say that rape of women is justifiable or one has to remain silent on that. There is no question where peace activists will decry uh, the, 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 all the acts that have been outlawed by the Geneva Conventions. But on the other hand, I will reserve my right to dispute ideologically formulated questions where you term someone as aggressor, you term another as innocent victim. I will not go into quarrel on that. All I can say is that I, in my main presentation, I have already said that for peace activists, context is as important as the question who threw the first stone. People in India, we are habituated. From our student age, we have been battling the forces of communal rights, the forces of communal discord. And we know this very, you know, how would you put it, banal question of the time, who threw the first stone? Who first attacked the mosque? Or who first attacked the marriage procession of the Hindus? Who threw the first stone syndrome is something that peace activists could be aware of. So if Lenin had gone by that road, then clearly even the first, in, in First World War, there was an aggressor. But that's not the way in which peace activists define uh, aggression or define their peace politics. Peace activists, the terms that they set are different. Their framework is different from the terms and the, from the framework of the warmongering parties. We cannot imbue the framework of the war parties. So what can be the key steps? Not many, but clearly important. And I take the cue from Sandro, but where I shall say is that if you think of the left forces during the Zimmer world, except the German parties, let us say the Bolsheviks and many others, they were ministry. They were not strong. They became strong precisely by pursuing the right policy to cope with war. War presents unprecedented opportunity for critical politics, for left politics, to reshape, reorient their transformative uh, strategies uh, for society. The key steps would be one, that the US, NATO allies, and Ukraine will make clear that NATO will not enlarge into Ukraine or any other state on the eastern side of Europe, period. Getting that promise, immediately Russia will stop the war and leave Ukraine. At the same time, peace activists must raise a much more strategic demand, disband NATO and outlaw global military alliances. China didn't enter, even in the heydays of the old socialism, any military alliance with any other country. In the great Afro-Asian world or Latin American world, you don't find the multilateral military alliances. NATO is an oddity in today's world. Peace activists must demand that NATO and global military alliances must be outlawed 
and they must rally behind the UN collective security arrangement. If that is insufficient, and clearly that is insufficient because the UN has been bypassed again and again by warmongers, recall the coalition of the willing of uh, Junior Bush, et cetera, et cetera, including expansion of NATO. Four, territorial integrity of countries is paramount. And democratic transformation would mean denazification and decoupling from neoliberalism. I know many peace activists and liberal, radical liberal, you know, people in Europe think Europe has been denazified. I do think that the rat lines, you know, the story is not over. I think an enormous supportive material can be presented if really there were to be one day a tribunal on that, how nationalists in Eastern Europe polluted with the later generation Nazis in making these countries the extremely, how would you call it? I do not know, I don't, uh, I, I'm at loss to find out the correct English word, but the kind of, uh, 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 how would I put it, uh, uh, frenzied nationalism that we get from the countries, partly because there is an alliance between the nationalists and the later generation Nazis. That must be very clearly combated. All these would mean, finally, we oppose militarism of all kinds. That means, again, we have to claim back their heritage of non-alignment in today's context. It can be done only when we have brought back the question of reconciliation, which was there brought in by radicals in the beginning of the 90s in the context of the ethnic wars. And I, Paula knows, many other friends know that when I wrote the politics of dialogue, I framed the principles of minimal justice, which was taken up for, 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 fortunately or uh, uh, to the great cause of the peace activists by many peace activists. What would be the principles of minimal justice? We all know what maximal justice would be, but what will be the basis of the dialogic justice on basis of, or on the, the taking that as framework, we can advance a politics of reconciliation. I do not think without fighting for reconciliation between Ukraine and Russia, without arguing for reconciliation between Russia and the post-Soviet Europe, we can have peace. What is the concrete root of militarism today? I do not think by avoiding that you know, million dollar question, we can work for peace. It has to be a concrete investigation of the concrete time. And in that context, we have to formulate the principles of dialogic justice and the cause of peace and reconciliation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I will come to Professor Musto for his deliberations. And there are a few questions from the students on um, you know, the effect of Ukraine war on uh, Emmanuel Macron's elections. So if you feel like taking it up, please do take it up and you could take up any of the questions that have been deliberated or not. So over to you, sir. Thanks. I have three minutes left, so I will try to be as short as possible. <clears throat> the first no, question... no, no, you can take more than three minutes. We will carry on. Thanks. The first question is about wars of aggression. Um, I believe that they are possible to recognize, and I wanted to clarify that a non-alignment policy does not always mean neutrality. It's not a policy of neutrality or not, ne or not recognizing the main responsibility in this case of Russia or ignoring the international right. I will try to respond like I did in my presentation using examples of the past. And I want to connect the things that uh, Rana Bir just mentioned with this debate that was, um, um, you know, that arose around the new army, a book that uh, Jean Jaurès, the most important socialist at the beginning of the 20th century published in 1911 a debate about the distinction between offensive and defensive war and the attitude that uh, the left should take in response to the latter, including the cases where a country independence was threatened, right? So in this case, we can act, he said, we can intervene, there could be this support to war. I believe that the response that Rosa Luxemburg gave to this 
idea in a, in a, in a review of the book that, uh, that she published the year after was very interesting. Luxembourg wrote that historical phenomena such as modern wars cannot be um, mis, um, uh, cannot be, sorry, misused uh, with the yardstick of justice, cannot be understood with the word of justice or through a people schema of defense and aggression. So according to Rosa Luxemburg, there is a difficulty sometimes to establish whether a war was really offensive or defensive or whether the state that started the war did it deliberately or just as a stratagem adopted by that country to um, create a bigger attack from, from the other one. The point here is how to avoid the escalation. And this is also connected with the, the question raised by, by Paola about women and about the fact that the struggle against militarism, as I try to say, was a core of the struggle against patriarchy. Um, this became a distinctive part, for example, of the International Women's Day and historically, um, struggles uh, of feminist movement opposed um, war, budget, and uh, also um, any new conflicts that featured uh, prominently in many platforms of the international feminist movement that featured this idea of uh, supporting the war. Now, the question of um, not condemning the war not condemning the war is a mistake. I mentioned this not only for the less of credibility for you know, future conflict, but also as Rana Beer said at the very beginning of his presentation, if we do so, if we apply this theory of just war, then peace politics, I'm reading from the notes that I took from his uh, intervention, peace politics is narrow or even impossible. So we cannot say that since the enemy of my enemy did the same, right? Then, you know, we should turn um, uh, toward another side, right? So since my enemy, United States is doing similar things or have done the same things, then we should not have a clear condemn and opposition to this. I believe that this would be a strong mistake and I hope I made it in four minutes, Paolo. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Invoke Chanukya, my enemy, enemy, uh, my enemy of my enemies, my friend, which is something that our students know very well, this strain of a thought. So thank you very much. I think this has been a very exciting debate that we've had today. I would request to all the speakers, I know this is totally off the cuff, you can refuse, but as the editor of Refugee Watch, I would like to bring out this debate in our next issue of Refugee Watch. So if you can, in a month or two, give me short notes. You know, I know you've all given us short notes. If you can just expand on the basis of your presentation today, then we will bring out this. I think this is a world-class debate that we had over the question of peace. And, um, you know, it'll be fantastic for our readers in South Asia to contemplate, you know, doing a round table for our refugee watch in the next couple of months. So thank you very much. You've had multiple sides to these questions, but I think this has been a clarion call to look at the question of peace from a different perspective. We have had three of the most influential critical thinkers of the present times here today together debating on the critical question of how to make peace without, you know, and all of them spoke about, we cannot think of peace without having a reformulation, a radical reformulation of how we look at war, questions of war, whether we, whether, you know, uh, from the perspective of the root causes or whether from, from the perspective of ideology or from the perspective of not looking at it as binaries of aggressor and liberator. So thank you very much, all of you. This has been a, a fantastic debate and like any successful uh, you know, deliberations, this has left us with many more questions rather than answers. We were not seeking answers. We were trying to bring out the questions and you have all three of you 
very successfully brought out the questions. Thank you very much. And thank you to all the participants for actively participating in this debate. There are a number of other participants who were probably itching to participate like me, but uh, we have gone way beyond two hours. So now we have to close, but this is not the end of it. We will keep coming back to this questions most importantly for existential reasons. Thank you again and hope to see you very soon again in the near future. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Ranabir. Bye, Sandra. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. And I see you soon, uh, Ranabir. Yes, 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 sure. Mm. Everything is done. The table will be laid out. <laughs> <laughs>